Hello everyone, my name is Ishan and I'm here today to talk to you about carnivorous plant cultivation hacks. I grow a wide range of carnivorous plants here in my apartment in Michigan and I would say I grow the majority of them and I don't have a lot of time because I am a physician by profession and I am finishing up my residency here. So I require a lot of hacks to cultivate this number of plants with the time that I have. So I have employed the use of wicks for watering and this allows me to water every carnivorous plant that I grow and use a reservoir so I can spend some time not watering them and having the reservoir do the job for me. This will allow you to maybe leave town and have not so much worry about your plants not getting water. Of course, depending on the size of your plant, they may require to have their reservoirs refilled more frequently or less frequently, up to several days, sometimes I would say up to two weeks in certain instances depending on the plant and the amount of water they consume. So the way I use the wicks is I would take the wick and loop it in an inverted U shape like this and run it through my pot. The pots I use are available widely on any online retailer of your choice but there's a lot of flexibility with wick watering you can run them through logs you can run them through net pots for certain highland nepenthes here you can see a nepenthes lowii growing here in a wick watered mesh pot on top of a food service container and I just take the lid and I cut holes in it as you can see here and let the wicks hang down into the reservoir. I usually keep the length of wick in the pot a bit shorter than the length of wick that is down in the reservoir. So I will demonstrate here just for everyone to see how I run the wicks through the pot and how you can do the same. So here I have a 4 inch net pot and 1 fourth inch cotton wick. I got this on Amazon and I just cut it kind of eyeballed it the length that would be appropriate for this size pot and these pots make it even easier because they have holes in the bottom already and I prefer to use net pots for things like Highland Nepenthes alternatively you could also wick water pure Akadama in a regular pot which would also give you a good benefit when it comes to drainage the wick watering works with everything from Akadama, peat and perlite, sphagnum and perlite, and a wide range of mixes. So here is one wick that I have run through this pot. As you can see, the loop sits right here, and I will run another one here to have two inverted u-shapes in this one pot here. This also allows you to use a wide range of reservoirs. Here you have Utricularia Humboldtii crossed with Alpina growing in a wine glass which I think is quite funny and cool at the same time and I often find people struggling when it comes to growing live sphagnum and keeping their plants happy at the same time when it comes to watering. Wick watering will eliminate the concern for this completely. 
Um, you will keep your sphagnum very happy and you will not overwater your carnivorous plants. Using this, I am able to grow almost every carnivorous plant that I've gotten my hands on. I have Saracenia. These are also planted in wick watered pots with reservoirs that I found on an online retailer and just run wicks through the pot and was able to grow these very easily. Darlingtonia, also wick watered. Here's some Drosophilum, also wick watered. Though I have heard that Drosophilum requires a period of low watering when they're flowering, so you might want to empty out the reservoir for that period and allow them to dry out a little bit. Rorigula, and a large number of Nepenthes that I'm growing here. So the next thing I would like to talk to you about is photo periods. I often hear people very concerned when it comes to dormancy if they're not living in an optimal cultivation zone for these plants. And that was kind of my anxiety when I first started cultivating these plants as well. Especially when it came to dormancy for Saracenia, Venus flytraps and such. And I was worried that my plants would die if I didn't give them a proper dormancy. But at the same time, it was going to be very inconvenient for me to have to take the rhizomes out and stick them in the refrigerator and uh, find a cold, dark place in this little apartment, which I don't really have. Um, so I decided to just give it a shot without dormancy for a while. And the only thing I did was I got one of those smart plugs that you can buy on Amazon or any other online retailer. And the, the brand I got was, I believe, a TP Link smart plug. Um, and that enabled me to set the time for sunrise as the time the light turned on and sunset for the time that the lights turn off. And this time period changes throughout the year as the seasons go by. And that was the only amount of variance I provided the temperate plants. And what I noticed is that it eliminated the need for dormancy, a hard dormancy with temperature drops completely. So here I have some Venus flytraps that are coming out of dormancy and doing great. Large number of Saracenia here that are flowering right on time in spring. And with this method, you won't see so much dieback with your Saracenia. Depending on the species, Oreophila still tends to die back a little bit and only produce phyllodes during the period of low photo period. But what I have noticed is your plants will grow much faster, not getting those huge temperature drops that they get in winter sitting outside. And my Saracenia flower twice a year instead of once a year. Quite frequently, I will get flowers in the spring and the fall, uh, allowing me to make crosses more frequently and have many more flowers with which to cross. Like this one, which is actually a fall flower that I pollinated. This is Dragon Queen crossed with Saracenia oreophila. And another way you can use these artificial techniques to hack your plants is with Biblis. Now when I started cultivating Biblis, I was kind of anxious that it's an annual. The one I was growing was Philifolia. And my concern was that it's an annual and I'm going to have to either take cuttings of it every year and repropagate it and it would die on me. 
when the time came. But I'm pretty stubborn and I decided to see what would happen if I did not change the conditions at all. So here I have my Biblis Philofolia, which has been going for over two years, contrary to the one-year lifespan they have in the wild. And the way I achieved this was by putting it inside of a terrarium. This is my lowland terrarium. The temperatures in here are about 72 degrees at night and about 85 degrees during the day and a constant photo period of about 15 hours, which does not change throughout the year. And this allowed me to grow my Biblis for this long without any dieback whatsoever. And it flowers almost continuously. I have not had one stretch of time where this plant was not flowering since it attained uh, maturity. And it puts on quite a lovely display. This specimen here is about three feet long and it's looping all around the back of the terrarium here as you can see and starting to branch out and the stem is starting to get areas of woodiness I'll keep you all updated on how long I can keep this up with this so-called annual plant thanks for listening and we'll stay in touch Bye-bye. And you can find me on Instagram at botanistmd. Thank you. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society, or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.